Awesome. All right. So um, our so I get to uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Um, so our speaker tonight is Dr. Jordan Maroka. Jordan is originally from Minnesota and did his undergrad at Drake University in Iowa, which I'm told is not affiliated with Drake the Rapper. And then he did his PhD at University of Colorado at Boulder, and then he moved to LA where he was a uh, postdoctoral uh, researcher at UCLA for a few years. And then this year he moved to McGill um, to join the McGill Space Institute, uh, where he is a uh, postdoctoral fellow of the Canadian Institute of uh, the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. Um, and today he's going to uh, tell us about uh, how uh, black holes grew in the early universe and grew over cosmic time. Can you hear me? How's this? In the back? All right, great. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming out. Uh, it's pretty amazing that a big group like this would be interested in hearing on, about black holes at the dawn of time on a Thursday night. So I uh, appreciate you being here. Um, so as my title suggests, um, I'm gonna tell you about black holes forming in the early universe, uh, the so-called cosmic dawn, which has become really interesting, especially in recent years. Uh, and this talk is really a talk about a big puzzle, okay? And that puzzle is very easy to summarize quickly. Uh, it is basically that we know supermassive black holes exist in the very early universe. These are black holes with masses of something like a million or a billion times more massive than the sun. Um, but we really only know of one surefire way to make black holes. Um, and that surefire way is related to stellar evolution and it produces black holes that are something like 10 solar masses. Okay. And so what gives? Uh, this is really the, the, the puzzle I want to get after in this talk. Um, so uh, before we get there, I'm going to go over kind of three big picture questions to make sure we all are on the same page and really appreciate why this puzzle is a puzzle. Um, and those questions are simply, what are black holes? Um, what's the observational evidence uh, that suggests that they exist? Um, and how do they grow? How do we expect them to grow? Um, and so in going through these questions, I'm going to touch on three sort of basic physics concepts um, called the escape velocity, hydrostatic equilibrium, and the Eddington limit. And in fact, these two are closely related, so it's really only like two and a half concepts. Um, and I'm going to uh, try to convince you that you really only need to know these three things in order to understand why this puzzle is so puzzling. Okay. So now that I've said the word puzzle way too many times, uh, let's jump into the first part of the talk, which is just, what is a black hole? Okay. Um, so a little history is, is useful here. Um, people have been thinking about gravity for a long time. Um, one of these very famous people who thought about gravity several hundred years ago is Isaac Newton, uh, who basically found uh, and described very elegantly mathematically that the, the force between two bodies, uh, M1 and M2, for example, the sun and the earth, is proportional to their masses, uh, how far they are apart from each other are, uh, squared, um, uh, with some proportionality constant, uh, cons uh, capital G, which is now known as uh, Newton's gravitational constant. Okay, so this is the only equation I'm going to show throughout this talk. It's really the only equation you need to know to understand what I'm about to say next. And so um, for a long time, uh, this equation has been known to be a very accurate description of how bodies move under the influence of gravity. Okay? It tells us that uh, things are attracted to each other uh, in an amount that's proportional to their mass, their distance, and some fundamental constant of nature capital G, but it doesn't specify what gravity is, okay? Um, and so people have been thinking about this for a long time. Einstein was one of them uh, who was thinking about many interesting things in the early 1900s, including gravity, okay? And so Einstein um, is really responsible in this diagram for this green grid that you see underlying the sun and the, uh, the earth. Um, he kind of compelled us to imagine gravity as a manifestation of space-time, okay? So you can think of space itself as being a sort of fabric, and by placing massive bodies in space, they distort that fabric locally. So you can imagine holding out a bed sheet uh, uh, with a friend and putting a bowling ball in the middle, and the, the distortion of that sheet is sort of analogous to what we're talking about here. And so you'll notice that there's a dis distortion in the presence of the sun in this diagram and a much smaller distortion um, due to the Earth. And so you can imagine now why gravity is an attractive force. Uh, if you imagine again this, uh, this bed sheet example, if I drop a second body uh, on a bed sheet that already has a bowling ball in the middle, it's going to want to fall 
uh, towards the center of that sheet. Okay. And so this is a higher dimensional warping of space-time. This is just an easy way to visualize it in two dimensions, but in reality this is a three-dimensional uh, warping of space-time. So um, this is a really important uh, insight, um, because if gravity is just a manifestation of space-time, then in fact light itself uh, should be subject to that, that warping. Okay, so not only will massive bodies um, respond to this, uh, this warping, but light itself uh, will be modified as it travels through space, and its trajectory could be altered. Um, and so a, a simple question that I want to start with to, to, to work on along those lines is basically why um, doesn't the Earth just fall into the sun? Okay, so if, if space-time is in fact warped and we're feeling this pull in that direction, um, why haven't we uh, fallen in? Um, so as you uh, know, we are in orbit around the sun, and so um, it's important to think about what that actually means. Okay? So if you imagine uh, a cannon sitting on the surface of the Earth, firing some cannonball, um, that cannonball is going to feel a force towards the center of the Earth, um, which p accelerates it downward. Right? Now, the Earth doesn't know about how fast this cannonball is moving. All that matters uh, are, are the masses of these bodies and how far off the ground uh, this cannonball is when it's fired. So we're going to assume here that it's being fired perfectly horizontally. Okay. And so no matter how fast I fire this cannonball, it's always going to take the same amount of time to reach the ground. Okay. So what that means is if I want to make this cannonball go further, I need to fire it faster. Okay. I could also play with the angle uh, at which I'm launching the cannonball, but we're not going to get into that. All right, so if I launch this cannonball faster and faster, it's going to go further um, before it hits the ground. But it's always going to take the same amount of time to get there. Um, and so you can imagine zooming out. Um, and again, we have our, our, cannonball, our, our cannon on the ground firing this ball. But now we can see that the Earth is curved. And so you can imagine asking, um, well, if I fire uh, the cannonball fast enough, in the time it takes to reach the ground, the Earth, too, will have fallen away, um, is one way of thinking about it. Right? Um, so this really is the concept of an orbit. If you were to try to do this on the, the surface of the Earth, you would need to fire this cannonball very quickly, something like seven kilometers per second. Um, and in doing that, uh, the, the cannonball would be kind of, the, the Earth would be falling away at the same rate as the cannonball, so it would never hit the ground. So this is in a very idealized setup where there's no atmosphere that provides uh, friction that would slow down the ball, uh, and so forth. So we can take this line of reasoning a little further and ask, uh, how fast does this cannonball have to move in order to escape the gravitational attraction of the Earth? Um, and the answer to that question uh, for the Earth is something like 11 kilometers per second. Okay, so this is pretty quick. Any rocket launched into space has to overcome uh, the gravitational field of the Earth by being launched at incredible speeds. Okay, so the escape velocity is really the only piece of physics that we need to know to understand what a black hole is. Okay? And the reason for that is uh, basically there's a speed limit in the universe, as far as we know, uh, and it's the speed at which light travels. Um, so light travels at something like 300,000 kilometers per second. So, in fact, what this means is when, we, uh, when sunlight arrives at the Earth, it's actually been traveling to us for about eight minutes. Okay? When you look at yourself in the mirror, if you're standing about one meter away from the mirror, you're seeing yourself as you were about three nanoseconds ago. Okay? So there's a light travel time there that is finite. Um, but this has important implications uh, with regards to the escape velocity because it sets a kind of maximum upper limit, the fastest speed we could possibly achieve no matter what we do is the speed of light. So that means if there were some hypothetical object that was so massive and so dense uh, that its escape velocity was in excess of the speed of light, there's nothing that could escape, okay? not even light. And that is precisely what it means uh, to be a black hole. There are objects that are so dense, uh, so massive, and so much mass in such a small area that uh, it's impossible to escape them. This leads to a concept uh, known as the event horizon. Uh, which is a way of describing the surface of a black hole. Okay. Now this isn't really a surface. Even if you could travel to a black hole, you wouldn't be able to stand at this surface. It's the point of no return, um, but it's really the only size scale that we can uh, think of in this problem. Um, and so you can kind of see this here. This is a kind of artist's depiction of matter swirling into a black hole. 
And at some point, not even light can escape the gravity of the black hole, and so we see nothing at all. Okay, so it's a black hole. Now, to give you a sense of scale here, um, it's interesting to think about how big black holes really are. So in reality, what's happening is as material crosses this event horizon, it's going to continue onward. It can't escape the black hole. And that, so there will be a, a kind of singularity at the center of the black hole where the laws of physics as we understand them break down. Um, but the, the, the event horizon is a, a scale that we can think about. It's a real physical size. And so if you took the sun and you squished it down into a, the, the smallest ball you could, um, it would turn into a black hole with a radius, uh, an event horizon radius of something like three kilometers. Um, and so here's a, a frame of reference for you. If you live in Montreal, what a scale of three kilometers looks like. So a black hole with the mass of the sun is comparable to the size of a city, okay? Kilometer scale. Um, supermassive black holes, say for example, a black hole 100,000 times more massive than the sun, are the sizes of stars, okay? So our sun has a radius of something like 700,000 kilometers. Um, and so the scale of a 100,000 solar mass black hole, the event horizon is indicated here roughly by this dotted white circle, okay? So while these are incredibly massive, dense objects, uh, their physical sizes are actually surprisingly small. Okay, so uh, ideally if you wanted to see a black hole, you would uh, try to go out and take a picture of one, uh, which is a bit challenging because kind of by definition they are invisible. Right? So how do you uh, take a picture of one? Um, that hasn't stopped astronomers, okay? So there's a telescope that's being operated now and continually being expanded called the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, uh, that's trying to image the black hole at the center of our own galaxy. Um, and because black holes themselves, though black holes themselves are invisible, they're often um, in, in environments where there's lots of hot material around, and that hot material radiates. And so in principle, you can actually see the shadow of a black hole against the backdrop of the ambient medium. So this is the whole idea behind the Event Horizon Telescope, which is actually a network of telescopes spread across the globe, uh, which you can't see terribly well here. But the idea is um, to look towards the center of our galaxy and see the black hole in silhouette against the hot material around it. So we expect to see images like this. And what's really cool about this is the, the shapes of these images. Uh, the shape of the, uh, the image you get of the black hole depends on uh, different models of gravity. So if general, general relativity were wrong, uh, we would expect to see deviations here. Okay, so this is just a simulation of what we'd expect to see if matter were swirling around the black hole like so. Um, we kind of put that through a model for our instrument and we would expect to see something like this. Okay, but the Event Horizon Telescope hasn't yet taken this picture. Uh, people are working very hard uh, on doing this, but we're not there yet. So you might ask, uh, in lieu of this picture, how do we even know that black holes exist? Um, so for the next few minutes, I want to go through the kind of main lines of evidence that suggest that black holes are real astrophysical objects, not just a cute thought experiment. Okay. So the first way uh, you can imagine seeing a black hole is not by seeing the black hole directly, but by watching uh, stars in its nearby neighborhood orbiting around it. Um, and this is exactly what astronomers at UCLA have done over the last some, uh, two decades or so. By monitoring stars in the center of our galaxy, they've actually watched them move over the course of about 20 years. And what you can see is that a few of these stars have basically completed an entire orbit around the center of uh, the very center of our galaxy, which is indicated with the star. In reality, there's nothing there. And so the, uh, this is probably the most compelling evidence of black holes, at least up until recently, because stars are orbiting an apparently dark part of the sky, and their velocities indicate that they're orbiting an object something like four million times more massive than the sun. Okay. Now, um, we can only really do this exercise in our galaxy right now uh, because it's close enough by that we can resolve uh, these objects with our telescopes. We can get a little further um, and do a similar exercise by looking at nearby galaxies. Though we can't resolve individual stars, they're just too small and too far away, we can kind of see the same effect blurred out on slightly larger scales. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of how this works, but these are some nearby galaxies for which this technique is done, and they too uh, show evidence for black holes with masses of millions, if not more, uh, solar masses uh, of the black holes in their center. Uh, and the really tricky thing about this is that, um, 
and, and a somewhat surprising fact about supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies is that their, their gravitational sphere of influence, that is the region in the galaxy over which their gravity dominates everything else, is actually quite small. Okay. So the gra the, only the stars really in these very central regions of galaxies even know that the black hole is there. Okay. And so if you want to use the motions of stars to learn about black holes, you have to see the stars that are closest in the centers of the galaxies. And as galaxies, as we look at galaxies that are further and further away, we have just uh, less and less ability to resolve those scales with our telescopes, whether the telescope's on the ground or in space. Okay, so stars orbiting black holes in the centers of galaxies can be used to effectively see black holes. Sometimes stars get too close, okay? Um, and they can actually be shredded apart in the strong gravitational field of the black hole. This is known as a tidal disruption event. Um, so what it's going to play here is a little movie. Is that playing? Yes. Where, and this is a numerical simulation of a tidal disruption event, um, where these astronomers have taken a star and sent it on a trajectory that gets uh, perilously close to the black hole. And then what happens is that as the star gets closer, the, the side of the star that's closest to the black hole feels a slightly stronger gravitational pull than the uh, side of the star that's further away from the black hole, which basically acts to stretch out this star as it approaches the black hole. And so it sort of spaghettifies before it um, is ultimately disrupted. And some of that material will fall into an accretion disk around the black hole and eventually accrete onto the black hole itself. So this allows you to see black holes at potentially great cosmological distances kind of by chance, uh, because once in a while a star will wander very close uh, to the black hole at the center of galaxies. Um, black holes don't really care where this material come fr comes from. Um, so in general, uh, uh, we see black holes through their so-called accretion disks. These are these uh, s uh, disks of swirling material that's falling into the black hole. And because that material is very hot, it's orbiting the black hole very quickly, it radiates at a variety of wavelengths that we can see with our telescopes. Um, so this is an artist's depiction of, a, of an accretion disk with this swirling material that's getting hotter and hotter towards uh, the black hole itself. And oftentimes these are, are known to be accompanied by bright jets that are often seen in the radio. Um, so while this is an artist's picture, we've seen things that are impressively similar to this with real observations. So for example, this nearby active galaxy M87 exhibits a jet coming out of its center that extends to scales much larger than the galaxy itself. Okay. So these can be potentially very powerful. Um, uh, these jets are accelerated to very high speeds and they can propagate very great distances. Now, accretion disks are actually seen in a lot of contexts. Uh, this is uh, a side note here um, because um, not only do we see them around black holes, whether those black holes are in binary star systems or powering active galaxies, but we actually see them in uh, much smaller uh, systems, protoplanetary disks. Okay, so this is a real observation of a, uh, a protostar in our own galaxy, and what you're seeing here is uh, the accretion disk and a jet coming out in the perpendicular direction. And this is another example, like M87 on the previous slide, of an active galaxy that's relatively nearby that exhibits these huge jets um, that are seen in the radio that are comparable to the size of the galaxy itself. Okay. So up until recently, this is where I would have stopped. Um, but of course, now we have a new way to see black holes with LIGO. This is a gravitational wave observatory. Um, its first detection occurred in February of 2016, and uh, I'm not going to go into the details here much, but this is the so-called CHIRP uh, that occurs when two black holes merge together. Okay. So this is an entirely new window into the, the black holes of the universe, and now there's yet another detector uh, that's a part of this observatory uh, that it is going to turn back on uh, again in just about a week. Right. Okay. So now that I've convinced you that black holes exist, um, we should talk about how they form, or how we think they form, okay? And this leads us to the second concept I want to cover. Um, so we talked about the escape velocity already, which told us about um, how, you know, the speed of light uh, really sets the size of black holes. Um, the second concept is uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, okay? So at this point, you might not be surprised that black holes exist, okay? If gravity is an attractive force, uh, and it's just trying to pull material together, then eventually, you know, we, everything should just become a black hole, right? It's inevitable if gravity is attractive. 
So the problem with that is as gravity is trying to squish stuff together, uh, that stuff pushes back. Okay. So for example, in stars, uh, the sun has a well-defined surface um, and is in a state of kind of relatively steady living because it's in this so-called hydro, uh, hydrostatic equilibrium where the, the force of gravity that's trying to squish it together is countered by thermal pressure coming from within the star. So basic, this, this diagram is much more complicated than it needs to be to convey this point. Um, but basically what's happening in the core uh, of the sun uh, is nuclear fusion. Okay, this is a, a furnace, but instead of burning coal, uh, hydrogen atoms are being smashed together to form helium. And when you do that, there's a little energy left over that eventually trickles out of the star. But basically this is a really hot, uh, dense medium that has immense pressure. Okay? And so that pressure is pushing outward while gravity pushes in. So we get this nice spherical object uh, in hydrostatic equilibrium. Now, this battle between pressure and gravity really governs the lifetime of all stars, um, which is uh, uh, the picture I'm showing you here. Okay? So uh, the thermal pressure in stars is provided by nuclear fusion. Uh, that depends on there being uh, raw materials, fuel, in this case hydrogen atoms, to fuse together in the heavier elements. Eventually that fuel runs out. Okay. So once that fuel runs out, our source of pressure that's pushing back against gravity will also subside. And actually uh, the, star, uh, the core of the star will contract and keep contracting until it reaches high enough temperatures to ignite new uh, lines of fusion. Okay. And over the lifetime of a star, depending on the mass of the star, it can go through the cycle many, many times. Um, but for very massive stars, the end product here um, is a core that will collapse to a black hole basically because there's no more uh, sources of pressure that can combat uh, gravity pulling inward. Oh. <laughs> you could take, <laughs> thanks. Um, so for a massive star, the core ultimately becomes a black hole uh, and the rest of the star explodes as a supernova explosion, okay? Um, and this is really the only surefire way we know uh, of making a black hole. It's kind of an, an inevitability of stellar evolution, at least for very massive stars, something like 20 times more massive than the sun. Um, so you can ask, um, how many black holes are there in the Milky Way? We, we've uh, talked about one of them so far, uh, the one sitting at the center of the galaxy, four million times more massive than the sun. Um, but in fact, there could be more. Uh, so, uh-oh. I didn't touch it, I swear. Oh, something's happening. Yeah, there we go. Save the day, Taylor. Okay, so this is an artist's conception of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. We don't have a real picture like this because we're unfortunately stuck in the Milky Way and it's hard to get out. Um, but the Milky Way is home to a few hundred billion stars. Okay, So potentially lots of opportunities to make black holes via the process I just described. However, only about uh, a tenth of a percent of all stars are massive enough uh, to form black holes. So observationally, we know that stars kind of come in a predictable mass distribution. There are a lot more low mass stars than there are massive stars, which leaves only uh, relatively few stars capable of turning into a black hole. However, uh, this is a lot of stars. Okay? So even a tenth of a percent of those stars is a big number. And so if you put this together, you find that, in fact, there are probably something like 10 million black holes zipping around the galaxy. Okay? And each of these things is something like 10 times the mass of the sun. Okay, so that's a lot of black holes. Um, so, but, but these black holes are something like 10 times the mass of the sun, maybe 100 if you're lucky. So certainly still they're stellar mass, not supermassive. Um, and this um, makes sense from a theoretical point of view, but in fact there are observations that support this picture as well. If we go out and try to find the most massive stars we know of, an example of which I'm showing you here, this is Eta Carina, um, this star is about 100 times more massive than the sun. So you might think in an optimistic scenario, I take all of that mass, I put it in a black hole, I've got a 100 in solar mass black hole, and that's still not great, but I'm in better shape than I was um, before if I'm, only got, if I'm only able to make a, say, 10 solar mass black hole. Uh, but what you'll notice about this star, it hasn't blown up yet, 
but it's shedding material like crazy. Okay? This is one of the least well understood pieces of stellar evolution, but observationally it seems as though stars shed a lot of their mass before they ultimately explode in supernovae. So what that means is uh, you're unlikely to get all of this mass into the black hole. Okay? And in fact, we only expect black holes to be something like 10 times the mass of the sun after this, uh, this process. Um, and so now that LIGO is online, this picture is support, uh, supported empirically uh, in a new way. Uh, what you're seeing here is a, a handful of the detections from LIGO. On the y-axis, I'm showing you how heavy they are in solar masses. Um, so this is 10 solar masses, 20 solar masses, 30 solar masses. And what you're seeing here are the black holes, uh, their masses before they merged uh, and after. Right? So the, the merger remnant is always more massive uh, than each individual black hole was to begin with. Um, but so uh, we're ending up with, we're starting with black holes that are say 10 to 20 solar masses and ending up with black holes that are 30 to 60 solar masses. Now this was a bit of a surprise. Um, we didn't necessarily expect there to be 30 solar mass black holes flying around galaxies, but there appear to be uh, black holes that are that massive. So a lot of people have been thinking very hard about how you make black holes that are 30 solar masses instead of 10 solar masses. Okay, so I think we're finally at a point where we can get back to this puzzle I alluded to uh, early on. Uh, and to just drive this point home, I'm going to revisit the movie uh, of the center of our own galaxy, where the orbits of stars over time have, have given us evidence that there's a 4 million solar mass black hole sitting in the middle uh, of the Milky Way. Okay, so if you haven't gotten the point yet, I'll, I'll say it very clearly, 4 million is much bigger than 10. Okay, so where do these black holes come from? Um, and you might think, well, the universe is an old place. Um, over time, stars and gas and dust uh, make their way to the center of the galaxy and accrete onto the black hole and it can, it can grow. Um, and you're right, the universe is an old place and these, pro these, these events are likely to take uh, take place. Um, but unfortunately, we know that these things exist at the so-called cosmic dawn. So this is the very early universe when it was less than a billion years old. There is actually a supermassive black hole in this picture. I'll help you find it. It's that. This doesn't, this doesn't look like much, but this is uh, one of the most distant known uh, supermassive black holes that has uh, yet been found. Uh, it's being, it's, it's, first of all, it's a billion times more massive than the sun. Okay? So it's a thousand times more massive than the black hole in the center of our galaxy. Um, we're seeing it just 700 million years or so after the Big Bang. And, and so the thing that we're learning from these observations is not only do black holes grow to be supermassive, they do it uh, very quickly, at least some of them. Okay. Um, and so the thing we need to talk about now is how do we expect black holes to grow? Like how quickly do we really expect them to be able to uh, grow in mass? Uh, and this brings us to concept number three, okay, known as the Eddington limit. Okay, so I use this example of the sun uh, whose lifetime is set by a, a battle between gravity and pressure. And that pressure in this case is provided by fusion ultimately in the core of the star, producing energy, uh, heat, which pushes back on um, gravity that's trying to kind of collapse the star in on itself. So if we imagine our black hole now uh, trying to accrete some material that's just flying around and some of it's going to you know, feel the, the force of gravity exerted by the black hole and come in. Um, but the problem with that is as gas falls into black holes, it's accelerated to high speeds. And when gas gets moving really quickly, it gets hot and it starts radiating. Okay. And so while radiation uh, has no mass, okay, photons are massless, they still carry momentum, okay? so, which means they can push on stuff. So in fact, uh, there's a new source of pressure here. It's not thermal okay, because there's no fusion happening in a black hole. And in fact, even if it was, uh, it couldn't get out. Um, but we have a new source of pressure, which is uh, radiation uh, produced by the uh, inflow itself. Okay? So this is sort of a self-regulating process, right? I can dump material onto a black hole, but it will heat up, produce radiation, and that radiation will push back. So potentially now, uh, and this, is, this limit is known as the Eddington limit. Um, you can think of this kind of in the same terms as hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay? So if all of a sudden I injected a new source of pressure into a star or an accretion flow, I, I, halt, I will either blow the star apart or I will halt the accretion flow in the case of a black hole. 
Okay, so this uh, introduces kind of a speed limit in, in forming black holes. And it turns out that uh, it's very hard to make a black hole that's a billion times more massive than the sun uh, during the cosmic dawn, um, following this uh, limit as a strict guideline. Okay. Um, so even if, um, yeah, even if you're able to form a black hole in the early universe, uh, the question then is, is there even anything around to accrete? Okay. So let's imagine a scenario where I've got some stars forming in the early universe. Uh, some of them are very massive, will explode as supernovae, but leave behind uh, stellar mass black holes that are you know, 10 or maybe 100 times more massive than the sun if we're lucky. Uh, the supernovae event that uh, happened when the black hole was formed blows away all sorts of material and just really lays waste to the environment that that star formed in. Uh, uh, which is being depicted here. So uh, this is just uh, a snapshot from a numerical simulation of galaxies forming in the early universe, um, and it's showing you the gas density. Okay, so yellow stuff is dense gas, uh, stuff out here is far away, uh, and there's not much stuff. Um, so what these authors have done is say, well, uh, I can put a little point uh, on a plot for wherever there's a star formed in my simulation, but then I can also look at where all the uh, gas is after these stars die and leave behind their black holes. And basically because the supernovae from uh, these events blow all the gas away, you're left in a situation where there are lots of black holes in this galaxy, but uh, the black holes don't live in the same place as the gas, okay? Which really means they're, they're starved. There's, there's nothing to accrete, okay? So even if you can make lots of little black holes in the er early universe, it's not clear um, how they grow. Um, and to make matters worse, um, so I still haven't solved the problem of um, making black holes accrete really quickly or, or forming in some special new way. Uh, and in the universe today, we know that not only do supermassive black holes exist, but they seem to, their masses seem to correlate with the properties of their host galaxies. Okay, so this is a well-known example. Uh, this is the, uh, the so-called M-sigma relation. So what you're seeing here is the mass of a bunch of black holes. And this is hard to read, but it starts at a million here. Okay, so this is a million times more massive than the sun, 10 million. 100 million, a billion, and this is some proxy for the mass of the bulge of these galaxies. Um, so basically the innermost regions before the spiral arms begin. Okay, so well outside the gravitational sphere of influence uh, of these black holes. And there is some correlation here. Okay. And again, this isn't expected basically because gravitationally, uh, the galaxy on these scales doesn't know that the black hole is there. Okay. So this is yet another mystery uh, that people have been thinking about uh, for a long time. And so to make matters worse, you might ask, where are all the intermediate mass black holes? All right. So we have a plot that started at a million here. Um, if, if the way that you form supermassive black holes is by taking a stellar remnant and allowing it to accrete over time, surely we'd catch some of those things before they made it here. Okay. Uh, and we don't really. Um, there are a few candidates for this. People have been hunting for these so-called intermediate mass black holes for a long time. That's black holes with hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands times. Uh, the mass of the sun. And so far, uh, I gather that there's maybe one compelling candidate uh, for this. They're tough to see in principle, but I mean, we haven't found them and, and we've been looking. So all of these difficulties have really gotten people scratching their heads about, you know, could there be a, a better way to make black holes? Um, and a lot of them re resolve, uh, revolve around this uh, pesky star middleman, okay? So wouldn't it be nice if I could form a black hole and not have to go through a star first? Because stars don't seem to become, don't seem to get more massive than about 100 times the mass of the sun. So this has led to a model that's uh, referred to as the direct collapse uh, black hole model. Um, and basically the idea is you take a big gas cloud and for one reason or another, it doesn't form stars, it just gets really massive and then it collapses in and on itself and forms a black hole and it skips this whole stellar evolution stuff. All right. So this is pretty tricky to, to pull off. People have been trying to simulate this in supercomputers for a long time. Uh, and the reason it's tricky is because basically when you take a big gas cloud, uh, uh, generally what this gas cloud wants to do uh, because of gravity is to fragment into a bunch of small pieces and make stars, okay? And not just make one star, but make lots of stars. Um, so you need to somehow prevent that from happening. Um, 
which is tricky because we so far don't have a source of pressure inside the cloud to resist uh, the force of gravity trying to pull it together. So we're back to these sort of hydrostatic equilibrium uh, arguments about, you know, can gravity beat out sources of pressure in these objects and allow them to collapse. So people have come up with this idea that, well, um, galaxies aren't forming in isolation in the early universe. They've got lots of neighbors. Um, so in this, uh, this is just a snapshot from yet another simulation showing you a region where a galaxy might form, but it's not the only one that's out there. There are some galaxies over here, there are galaxies over here, and those galaxies radiate. Um, and so the basic idea is if there are uh, sources of radiation nearby, that radiation can penetrate into these clouds and provide a source of pressure that's sort of uh, introduced externally rather than from within the cloud itself. Okay. So you can actually make this work if you're patient and have lots of time on a supercomputer. Um, and so these authors have done this, and they basically found um, a few places in, in numerical simulations where these kinds of objects emerge. So what's going to happen here is we're going to keep zooming in and zooming in on this, this region of, of gas. And the point of this movie is to show that as you follow this uh, gas down to very small scales, it doesn't really fragment apart. Okay? It's not forming lots of stars. It's for the most part uh, a single cloud, though it has some structure in it. And so this is a, an impressive computational feat that suggests that, in fact, maybe these kinds of objects do form. Um, I believe in this simulation, this object has something like 100,000 uh, solar masses worth of material. So if you could form a black hole out of this, you'd have leaped forward many orders of magnitude uh, in resolving this puzzle. Okay. But even then, uh, even if you can make a black hole that's 100,000 times the mass of the sun like that, um, you still have four orders of magnitude left to go. Okay. So we still need some accretion or some other process to help these black holes grow. So we're, we're by no means there yet. Um, but it's an interesting time to be thinking about these puzzles. A lot of exciting uh, observatories are coming online in the next 10 years. Uh, so a few of them I've shown here, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will launch in a few years, has a big mirror about uh, three times the size of Hubble in radius. So it'll be able to see these kinds of objects at greater distances and maybe tell us uh, if there are smaller black holes in the early universe um, or if there are all these sort of billion solar mass behemoths. Um, and similarly, big telescopes on the ground um, should, should work along these lines but also help us to measure black holes more precisely in galaxies nearby. A few more uh, things to be excited about are kind of uh, not quite as far along in the planning. They're still being designed. Um, so Athena is a next generation X-ray telescope, which could potentially see the accretion onto black holes at great distances. And LISA, which is basically a space-based gravitational wave observatory, um, could in principle see intermediate mass black holes merging uh, all the way back to the dawn of time. So I'll take one slide to mention um, one line of research we're pursuing here at McGill, which is to say, let's forget about trying to see black holes or their accretion disks or their mergers directly, um, and instead look for the signatures of those black holes in larger scale features in the sky. Okay? And so what you're seeing here is essentially a simulated map uh, of the temperature in the early universe. Hot spots and cold spots, hot spots corresponding to regions with lots of galaxies, cold spots uh, corresponding to regions where not much at all is going on. Um, and what's been indicated here with the arrows are the fields of view of the James Webb Space Telescope. Tiny. Okay. And so for rare objects like supermassive black holes, it's going to have a hard time finding them okay, because you need to survey a huge area of the sky in order to get lucky enough to see one of these things. Um, once you see it, you're in good shape. You can do a lot of cool stuff, but just finding them in the first place is a challenge. So something we're working on here under the guise of the Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array, which is a big telescope being constructed in South Africa, is to ask, well, maybe can we can find these things not by looking for them directly, but for looking, by looking for the impact they have uh, on the environments in which they form. Okay. So, I hope I've convinced you that uh, this is a, a very interesting puzzle, how you form black holes in the early universe that is very much unresolved. Um, but hopefully this will uh, lead you to kind of pay close attention to what's happening in the news in the next few years and hope for some uh, cool new discoveries. So, with that, I will take any questions you have. Thanks for coming.
<laughs> That's right. Why is it a million times? Oh, so yeah, the, so the question is basically why is there this uh, linear relationship between this, the event horizon size of a black hole uh, and its mass? And you're right, that was a, a sharp observation just of the relative scales that I showed many slides ago. Um, and I don't have a great intuitive response to this question other than the fact that, um, yeah, how do, how do I explain this here? Do you have a good intuitive explain explanation for this, John? I'm going to defer to my colleagues. That's right. So, right. So the escape velocity changes with radius as well. Right. So that's the key, uh, I think, to this. Um, yeah. Sorry, kind of, yeah, it's not a great answer. I, I also don't like it when people say the math works out that way. Um, but it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so certainly there would be some radial dependence, some interplay between the, the pressure and the gravity as a function of radius, right? Um, but I think the key uh, assumption here that people like to potentially violate is uh, the assumption of spherical symmetry, right? So if you're thinking about ways to get around the Eddington limit, uh, a good way to do it is to have material coming in along one direction and radiation escaping along another direction, uh, which is maybe what you're getting at here. Um, and so some people like to break the Eddington limit as a way to form black holes more quickly. Um, this is tricky. Empirically, it looks like black holes obey the Eddington limit um, for the black holes where you can measure their mass and their luminosity independently. Um, this is something John works on a little bit again. Um, so, yeah, while it, it would be a nice theoretical solution to the problem of, yeah, breaking the Eddington limit, uh, at least in the objects that have been studied in detail, it doesn't appear to be uh, something that's easily violated. So you're right that uh, as the universe expands, it's kind of becoming more rarefied uh, with each passing day. Um, I think the problem, and, and so that uh, translates down to smaller scales as well. So we do expect the first galaxies forming in the early universe to actually be denser on average than galaxies are today. Um, but I think once the first star forms, everything changes. Uh, and in fact, uh, the main effect here, th th though that the galaxies are more dense on average than galaxies today, the supernovae explosions in which these black holes form just lay waste to their environments. And so the fact that the gas was dense just before that is true, but afterward it's completely uh, excavated of material. That material is very hot and has a hard time accreting black, uh, back onto the black hole. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting point, but um, it's, it's tough to get around the, the supernovae explosions. So the question is about what happens inside of a black hole. Um, and we've entered territory now where I think there are something like five people on Earth who think about this, and I am not one of them. Um, but there are some very trippy movies you can find online um, that try to depict what would happen to you if you flew into a black hole, and it's completely mind-bending. Um, all I really know is that eventually the material has to come to a point, a singularity. Uh, there's nothing stopping it. And this is, not a, this is a tough regime to think about for phys physicists because we're talking about immense gravitational fields on very tiny scales, so where quantum mechanics usually kind of 
is the name of the game. And these two theories, fundamental theories of the universe, are known to be incompatible with each other. <laughs> and so the, the, the center of a black hole inside the event horizon is really the kind of ultimate test of quantum gravity and things like this. And so that's all I, that's all I can say about that. <laughs> so uh, it is a plasma. So there are multiple chemical species in the accretion flow. Uh, but the material is so hot that for all of these elements that have different numbers of protons and neutrons, um, all of them are stripped completely of their electrons. So there's essentially an electron fluid and then a bunch of heavy ions. Okay. And they are, you know, the, we expect the chemical breakdown to be, you know, not dissimilar from what's in the sun um, if that material is made of the same sort of material uh, that the star formed out of, that stars form out of. Um, what was I going to say? Um, Right, so uh, that's true with the exception of iron. So in fact, iron may not be fully ionized in accretion disks. So you can actually, they, they can basically have some visible features due to iron. Um, but otherwise, they're just a hot plasma, protons and electrons um, spiraling inward towards the black hole. So the, their kind of diversity of chemical species is thought to be mostly irrelevant, um, I think, in most contexts. I was worried someone would ask about this. Um, so the question is about Hawking radiation, um, which I don't know very, really anything about, other than that it appears to be uh, supported from theoretical models. Um, I do know that for kind of macroscopic black holes, astrophysical black holes, um, this is uh, completely negligible. Um, but in the context of, say, if you could form black holes right after the Big Bang that are microscopic black holes, I think they can evaporate through this mechanism. Um, but I, I could not tell you in more detail than that um, how this works. Or, or right, because the whole premise of black holes is that nothing escapes except for, uh, in some cases, this so-called Hawking radiation. So yeah, unfortunately, I can't answer that question in more detail. Um, Yeah, so some stars can be happily in stable orbits and may not plunge into the black hole ever. Um, due to interactions between stars in the galactic center or stars flying in from greater distances, the thing you really need to happen for a star to get disrupted is it needs to come on a very, what's called a radial orbit. So it needs to be kind of plunging to get it as close as possible to the black hole where it'll feel this tidal uh, elongation. And so I don't know the fate of most of the stars in the galactic center. I don't know if they're predicted to uh, get swallowed up or if future interactions amongst themselves will kind of change their orbits. But in general, right, um, uh, stars may not be shredded apart. Um, it just depends on what kind of an orbit they're on um, and how close they get to the black hole. Yeah, so the question is for these models where you essentially skip the star phase and go straight to a black hole, how do you, how do you get around the problem of when you have a very dense core forming, why wouldn't nuclear fusion begin? And I think, in fact, in a lot of these models, fusion does begin. So you get sort of a quasi-star or a supermassive star. But uh, because uh, it's, this gas cloud has been prevented from collapsing for so long, it's accumulated much more mass then uh, typically accumulates before collapsing into a star. So basically the fusion that does ensue can't resist the force of gravity, and so it's sort of short-lived. And yeah, it turns on, but that radiation will never make it out, and uh, it just collapses in on itself. But yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we 
running in the future. Gosh. I was at a talk recently on this exact topic. Um, so I could answer this in a, a few ways. For a long time, people wondered about if maybe dark matter itself were composed of black holes. Right? So we know that most of the matter in the universe is dark. Uh, we only know about it because of its gravitational influence, and so black holes are kind of an obvious candidate there. It's something we can't see, but it, it gravitates. Um, and people are still thinking about this, uh, though it's looking like from a variety of angles, uh, the range of parameter space where such where this kind of works to explain dark matter is pretty limited. Um, you could also ask not, you know, are, are black holes dark matter, but could dark matter, whatever it is, not black holes, influence the formation of black holes? And uh, I'll speculate here that, you know, for some crazy classes of dark matter models that kind of change how gravity works on small scales, maybe there are games you can play with uh, either forming more massive black holes right off the bat or making it more favorable for gas to accrete into a black hole. Um, and I know there are people thinking about this. In fact, even at McGill, I think we have <laughs> people who are thinking about this um, that would be able to answer this much better than, than I'm doing right now. Uh, so before I embarrass myself further, I'll, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> This is a very good question. So how do you measure the mass of a galaxy? Um, so there are a number of ways you can do this. Uh, one is sort of a, an extrapolation from the stellar orbits argument. So as galaxies get further away, we can't actually resolve individual stars anymore and map their orbits over time. Uh, the distances are just too great. Um, but we can actually see their motion in aggregate if we look at spectra. Okay? So stars have lots of features in their, their spectra, essentially the which quantifies their color, and those features get broadened out more for galaxies that are rotating faster. So again, if you want to learn something about the mass, you need to know how fast objects are moving in the gravitational field, um, and how far apart or how far away they are uh, from the center of mass. Um, and so, without getting the details of how spectroscopy works, um, you can essentially infer how fast the stars are moving from monitoring. Uh, spectroscopic lines. The other way you can do it is just to imagine you know something about stars. So we know, uh, you know, the sun is yellow and it is about uh, one solar mass by definition. Um, and we have uh, comparable constraints on stars of a variety of masses. And so you can look at a galaxy and basically just ask how bright is it and what color is it? And I can try to constrain the mass, uh, the stellar mass of the galaxy that way. Right? So again, we have to worry about the difference between the mass and stars and the total mass, which is what we care about uh, for gravity. Um, but if you then think you know how much dark matter there is in the universe, you can kind of bootstrap your way up to the total mass of the galaxy. Um, and there are probably other ways I'm missing, but I'll, I'll leave it there. So it's a good question. That's right. So the question is about the nature of these jets that appear to emanate uh, in a direction that's perpendicular to the accretion flow. This again is another very active area of research. Um, we know observationally that these jets can be moving at substantial fractions of the speed of light. Okay? So they are launched at very high speeds. Um, but we really don't know uh, how they're launched. There are many models for how this material gets out of the disk and uh, shot into such a narrow feature. We also don't know why they are so narrow. Right? So the kind of one of the striking things about the images of jets is that they're incredibly narrow over a huge uh, kind of galactic range of scales. And um, so you're right that that material that's in the jet is not making it into the black hole, but that's not a huge loss in terms of the kind of total mass budget of what's available uh, to accrete on the black hole. So in terms of forming the black holes, even if they show strong jets, um, that's not a huge loss in terms of accumulating mass. Oh, 
Oh man. I have no idea how to answer that. It's a good question, but... So the question is, could we be living inside of a black hole and not know it? And, um, yeah, this is kind of like, are we living in a supercomputer simulation? Um, I don't know. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you a good answer here. It's worth thinking about more. Presumably someone's been, been thinking about this. There's always at least one person thinking about these things. Yeah, but if the if the rules break down, you know, who's to say? Yeah, sorry, I don't know. Yeah, happy to. All right. Thanks.